Yeah, so to everyone joining today, thanks so much for, for uh, signing on and, and expressing interest in so far and the all new Spotter 3. Uh, my name is Nevin DeParlo. I'm our commercial business lead here at SoFar Ocean. And I'm also joined today by Evan Shapiro, who's our co-founder and CTO, which is really exciting. His background is, is quite a bit cooler than mine, unfortunately. Sorry for the, the white space. Um, and we'll just ask that everyone hold off on questions until the end. You can drop them into the chat during the presentation, and we may have someone who will be sorting through and, and answering those in real time. And then we'll save some time at the end for uh, live Q&A as well. Um, so at SoFar Ocean, our mission is to connect the world's oceans to power a more sustainable future. And the reason we're on this mission is because there's a need for more accessible ocean observations. Uh, there's a massive data gap that exists both in the open ocean and near shore coastal environments, largely because the cost and complexity associated with ocean sensing is, is really high. Uh, there are very high barriers to entry historically that look something like this. Um, a traditional med ocean buoy could be the size of a truck and cost up to a million dollars. Um, we're moving from very few and extremely expensive solutions to um, many and very low cost solutions that can be deployed rapidly and at scale. Um, so this is what we're trying to enable at SoFar Ocean today with the spotter buoy and more specifically the spotter three, which I'll pass it off to Evan to talk a little bit more about. Thanks, Nevin. Uh, so we've been building the Spotter product for around four years now. We've deployed thousands of them in the ocean uh, with our own owned fleets of sensors, as well as many customers. The, the goal is to make something that is much smaller and much more affordable than uh, the traditional industry standards. This uh, can span from cheap, hardware that can be deployed with a single person off of a small vessel. Um, we are also doing air deployments now. Uh, and we've learned a lot as we've done these many missions, many deployments ourselves and with partners from the Spotter platform. Uh, Spotter 3 from the outside looks very similar to the legacy Spotters that we've been building and deploying around the world but we've made some really core improvements under the hood uh, that are also gonna set us up for uh, future expansions and flexibility. So there's, there's a whole list of them, but I wanna kind of pick the highlights here. We'll be sharing a lot more detailed documentation around the specific changes and what we've improved. Uh, one of the big things is we've added an atmospheric barometric pressure sensor to the, the core platform suite. This helps for a lot of use cases. Um, we have a new and more modern processor platform under the hood, which is providing around 10 times uh, the compute resources across the board as our previous processor platform, and all at a lower power budget. Uh, we've made a, a wide number of improvements to usability, uh, you know, doing field failure analysis and finding the, the most common failure modes uh, and addressing those with design improvements. We've added durability changes that are working towards allowing us to deploy these from any uh, airdrop parameters at any altitude, any speed, uh, without a descent, assist, shoot, or drove, which is pretty exciting. Uh, and then we're also uh, have added a cellular telemetry capability to the platform so that for coastal deployments that are in range of cellular, we can do a lot more data uh, for a lot less cost. Awesome, thanks, Evan. Um, and to talk about some of these features in more detail, we also really wanted to call out a few customers that we're really excited about and, and some cool projects that they're working on um, because they're really excited about the Spotter 3 and all the new capabilities that it unlocks. So the first that we wanted to, to dive into is a project that we're working on with NOP that's focused on Atlantic hurricane observations and really catching a major storm event. Um, so the whole goal here is to use the new spotter platform in both coastal arrays and an offshore drifting network to capture real-time data on extreme weather events. Um, and we're trying to directly measure the impact of a major storm in 2022 with in-situ observations, uh, primarily focused on the Gulf of Mexico and along the U.S. East Coast. So what's really exciting about NOP in this project is that it actually utilizes the entire spotter sensor suite. 
Um, everything from the onboard atmospheric barometer plus bottom mounted pressure sensor to look at water level directly impact uh, the, the data collected in this project. And they're all critical data points for the success of the project. Um, in addition to having the full spectrum data from the, the spotter as well, looking at waves. Um, one other thing that's really unique about the Knot project is that all of the spotters are deployed by regional partners, which could be local fishing, charter boats, or even universities, which really goes to, to um, sort of speak to the point of spotters rapid deploy capabilities um, and the fact that we're breaking down not only the barriers of cost, but also complexity associated with ocean sensing. Um, one feature that's critical for NOP and for, for standard um, hurricane observations is rapid deployment. Uh, we need to be able to deploy spotters quickly ahead of major storm events as soon as they're named and as soon as we know that uh, there's potential for the one to pass over the Gulf of Mexico, for instance. So being able to enable airdrops was a key performance uh, metric that we wanted to hit prior to kicking things off. And, here are a few videos that show rapid deployments, whether it be off of the back of a, a chartered fishing boat, out of a helicopter, or out of a plane that are all going to contribute to the success of NOP and are all unlocked due to the improved durability of the Spotter 3. Uh, and so we'll use this use case to highlight a couple of the big additions to the platform. Uh, Specifically, cellular is a big enabler for these types of deployments. We are looking at regions that are populated coastlines. Uh, we want to have systems that will eventually be able to feed into real-time alerting systems. There's a lot of complexity and richness going on in what we're measuring around these coastlines. And so the cellular telemetry option uh, is going to let us send a lot more data. So from looking at a pure bandwidth limitation, it's at least a thousand times the available bandwidth as compared to satellite telemetry and dramatically reduced costs. Uh, we've put a lot of effort and testing into adding the cellular capability to Spotter. We want to do it in the best way possible. Um, we have done a wide range of investigations into different RF integrations for the antenna. We've done a lot of lab and uh, bench testing as well as proper deployments. And so you can see uh, that image is actually showing a deployment transect of one of the tests we did with validation units locally going up to around 15 miles offshore. We've seen reliable cellular performance at up to 30 miles offshore, uh, depending on, on the test site and, and the cellular area. Um, the telemetry provider we're using has near global coverage and the uh, chipsets in the telemetry modem uh, can work with a wide range of cellular bands. Uh, the intent here is that it will be an easy plug and play experience for users where if they turn the system on, it'll generally be able to connect and find the cell channel back to our back end, and all the data is as accessible through the API as it is through the satellite integration today. And so what to do with that additional data. So there's the immediate cost savings, which are, are pretty compelling. So for context, uh, sending hourly uh, spectra, so directional moments and uh, surface variance density from a spotter over the typical satellite telemetry provider, uh, it costs upwards of $500 a month just for that satellite data cost. And so after a reasonable deployment, the satellite data costs dominate the overall cost of the system and the deployment compared to the hardware costs. Uh, we're looking at orders of magnitude uh, cheaper data with cellular, but we can also send a lot more data. And so the first feature that we will be launching that will take advantage of this higher data bandwidth is to actually send a much denser uh, surface spectra report in time. And so today, Spotter can be configured to send spectra that's analyzed over 30 minutes to hours uh, on a cellular telemetry option, it'll be sending around a one minute time series of wave spectra. Uh, the reporting intervals can be adjusted from five minutes up to hours to optimize for cost and power considerations. Uh, but having this time series of, of wave spectra, so effectively a spectrogram in our backend database now allows all of the traditional spectral analyses 
uh, to be done on the web. It can be done retroactively. It can be done at query time. So for use cases that want to be detecting storm surge in front, they might want to have a very uh, recent real-time window of a 10-minute analysis. Uh, for folks that are looking to integrate these into models, they might want to have hourly analyses that are justified on a UTC basis clock. All of that will be able to be applied at query time uh, after the fact, uh, and also online in real time for this data that's coming in over cellular. Yeah, and another customer that's really excited about some of these features and that we're really excited to be working with is the University of Tokyo. Um, and their Graduate School of Frontier Sciences is actually a, a big spotter customer, and they've actively been deploying spotters in the Arctic for a number of years now. Um, specifically in both the Arctic and in the Southern Ocean, focused on polar regions um, where climate change is much more visible and things are rapidly changing and we need to be able to better monitor and actually measure those changes in real time. And that's exactly what the spotter is unlocking for them. So what these, cap what these deployments have shown is that the spotters can withstand ice crush and survive the polar winter. And specifically with the Spotter 3 platform, one of the features that's really exciting is that it offers a 40% reduction in average power consumption over a legacy system. So for customers like the University of Tokyo who are focused on monitoring uh, the, the polar regions, they have better control over their ability to last in, in long environments with minimum sunlight uh, and still collect the data that they need. Uh, in addition to the Spotter being uh, overall, just having a lower power consumption. They also have more control over the sampling configurations, which will reduce power consumption on an as need basis. Cool. So I'll, I'll dig into the, the power consumption a little bit because 40% sounds great, but what does it really mean? Um, the way that we assess power performance of our systems is uh, to come up with descriptions of operational domains. So how does that power budget, how's that power consumption translate into expected operation in, uh, in time and location? Um, and so the, the charts on the right are uh, a little complicated, but effectively what we're looking at is uh, those magenta regions in that chart are places where the battery, based on this model, which we can tune with uh, our, our thousands of systems that have been deployed around the world, when and where will the battery be empty? On, on the x-axis, we have degrees of latitude. On the y-axis is time. Uh, and so if we deployed a system at uh, 64 degrees of latitude in this, this year, this location, we would expect that the battery would go empty sometime in December, and it would wake back up in, in late January. Uh, on the bottom, now we have the boundaries of these domains for different systems. Our legacy spotter, we typically expect to see reliable continuous performance up to between 55 and 58 degrees. Depends on location, depends on weather, depends on some external factors, so the variability in there. Uh, with Spotter 3 in our default sampling configuration, uh, we're pushing that up to around 61 degrees north. And with the configuration we now have in terms of flexibly adjusting system settings to try and maximize power, uh, we're pushing up towards the Ar Arctic Circle of having continuous deployments. This is really compelling for customers that are doing polar region deployments, but these savings also translate to things like regions that have uh, particular high, high rates of cloud cover, fog. If you're in a bioactive region and your solar panels are getting biofouled all the time, this performance also translates into uh, a much longer operational duration for spotters in energy constrained environments. Yeah, the last customer that we really wanted to highlight today is Fugro um, and how they're tapping into the spotter and the smart mooring and our overall network and data solutions to collect ocean data at scale um, and really unlock that. And as a global company, as you can imagine, they have a lot of different resources. Uh, in the picture on the right, you're actually looking at a, a spotter next to what looks like a, a a uh, blown up spotter that's about 10 times the size, it's a pretty cool picture. Um, and that sort of shows the evolution of how their capabilities in terms of ocean sensing have evolved over the years um, and why they're really excited about the spotter. So a couple of the ways that we're working with Fugro and a couple of the reasons why they're excited about the spotter three, 
First and foremost, they're tapping into a network of spotters in the Gulf of Mexico that deliver open ocean or offshore data to enhance their uh, offshore forecast for operations in the Gulf of Mexico, primarily focused on the oil and gas industry. Um, barometric pressure is a key new addition here because it's, it's a critical parameter for forecasting overall. Um, in addition to that, Fugro also does a lot of coastal work, especially with the emerging offshore wind industry. And so the combination of the Spotter 3 and the Smart Mooring really unlocks a new level of cloud-connected data for coastal environments. And that's something that they're really excited about, and so are we. Um, the increased onboard processing power and the cellular connectivity really enable more sensor integrations. Um, and one example of that is basically being able to provide connectivity to subsurface multi-sensor landers. Um, that are collecting all different types of environmental data to support different industry stakeholders. Um, in addition to that, having more reliable, low-cost ocean sensors that can be rapidly deployed anywhere in the world is critical to just advancing their overall strategy for providing data solutions to customers across different segments and in different regions. Um, they're working on a product called Gaia Hub, which is actually shown here, that will aggregate and distribute all different types of environmental, geophysical, or med ocean data to their customers and having the ability to add much more data to that through the spotter and through the smart mooring is really important. Um, and they're looking at deployment mechanisms of, of all means, right? Whether it be airdrop, more deploying drifters from vessels uh, and many other applications as well. So we just mentioned the smart mooring and we talked quite a bit about the spotter, but we're also really excited to tell you a little bit more about where we're going with the smart mooring and the subsurface environments in general. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, the spotter really breaks down the barriers of cost and complexity associated with ocean data collection at the surface. Um, but the truth is that below the surface, it's even harder to collect data, especially at scale and especially in a cost effective manner. Um, so what we're doing is we, we built the smart mooring to break down those barriers below the surface as well. And the smart mooring essentially can connect any sensor to capture real-time data below the surface where the spotter effectively becomes a power and communication node. Uh, it's built on an open standard uh, marine connectivity protocol that we call Bristlemouth. You can learn more about that online and Evan's going to talk about it in a few minutes. Um, and all of the third party data from these sensors becomes available through the same dashboard and API, right? So streamlining that process of making real time subsurface and surface data available um, and easily accessible both to our customers and maybe even to their clients further downstream. And ultimately our goal with the smart mooring is just to, to accelerate the capabilities of sensor extensibility on the spotter platform. And that's what's most exciting. And that's sort of what we alluded to with Fugro's use case on the last slide. So uh, Fugro's use case leverages a lot of the same capabilities as the NOP project. These are coastal systems uh, that are, are going to be generally deployed where there is cellular connectivity. We can take advantage of the higher data rates uh, the barometer adds a lot of power to forecasting and depth measurements. Um, but there's an additional dimension to this use case that uh, we'll use to highlight a few features here, and that is the need for flexibility. These are going to be uh, deployed and recovered and redeployed. They'll need to be reconfigured. Uh, maybe we'll add different sensors for certain applications. Maybe different routines will need to run on the processing for different applications. Um, and so one of the other major features that we're launching with the cellular capability is an over-the-air update capability. So this is the ability to update firmware of the system while it's deployed remotely. Uh, and most importantly, it's the ability to do it safely and reliably. Uh, and to do this, we are using two off-the-shelf protocol technologies that have wide adoption in industry uh, so a reliable file transfer protocol to get new firmware capabilities to a system, uh, and then a bootloader method uh, that's very common in ARM systems called MCU boot, uh, which offers the ability to update systems automatically. It provides safe fallback functionality. So if something goes wrong, it can swap back to previous images. Uh, they are securable. So when we get to the point of allowing users to, to create their own firmware or subroutines that need to run, uh, those that can be done securely with signed images and uh, this pattern scales seamlessly to firmware updates on a connected bristle mouth system so you can imagine if you had a smart mooring system 
uh, with some intelligent modules connected, we can use the same general update mechanisms to update those nodes as the main platform, and we're just essentially addressing different addresses on that network. Uh, and, and then the other element, of course, is that these are moored systems that need to go in the ocean, in coastal regions, high energy, a lot of activity. Uh, they've got to be really tough. Uh, and so alongside Spotter, Spotter 3, we have a major revision to our smart mooring platform in general. Uh, we have increased our cabling strength so that we're able to hit two times peak loads. and we've increased fatigue resistance uh, by at least 20 times uh, as, as measured in a few different ways. Uh, there's been a lot of testing. There are now some robots that, that live at SOFAR that are, are pictured their full-time jobs are, are torturing cables and simulating different extreme conditions for testing. Um, but, but the general outcome of this is that we wanna make sure that these systems can be deployed in as wide a range of energetic environments as possible. They can be configured with uh, flotation and different sensing needs, and that they can be recovered and redeployed reliably. Uh, along those lines, to make the system really flexible and really fit a user like Fugro, uh, they need to be approachable and uh, configurable by people in the field, by users. And so we are building out the overall smart mooring and bristlemouth ecosystem to make these systems uh, easier to change and reconfigure on the fly. This includes elements like a custom payload uh, enclosure and mount solution for people that are developing their own sensor integrations into smart mooring. Uh, it includes mount solutions for the, the sensors we support today, like, like RBRs that protect the fragile neoprene uh, cables that, that are used in those subcon systems, as well as provide general rugged and reliable mounting solution. Uh, things like modular flotation with integrated strain relief. So moorings can be reconfigured for changing water depth on the fly. Uh, this is a sample of some of the bits that we're building. Uh, we're trying to build out this toolkit so we can have this off the shelf Lego kit where it's very easy to reconfigure a marine system for deployment and that we can start empowering users and uh, customers to do that on their own with, with their own kit of smart mooring and personal ecosystem components. Yeah, and in addition to all the really exciting technical capabilities that we just talked about and customer stories that we highlighted, I think we always like to end things off with, with really why we're here and why we're on the mission that we are to connect the world's oceans. Um, at the end of the day, we live on planet ocean and we want to have an impact both on conservation, extreme weather and emissions. Um, and you'll find that all of the new developments that we've made with the spotter and the smart mooring will significantly make an impact on all three of these buckets. Uh, and we're really excited to share more about all of these with you in the future. Um, in addition to, you know, answering or asking any questions during this session, if you, if you ever want to reach out to us directly, here's my contact information and we would be really excited to talk to you more about how the spotter and the smart mooring could make an impact on your projects or research. So we'll, we'll open the floor up for questions now and sorry for my lights during out this conference room has uh, automatic lighting and it. it tends to think I'm not in here. Um, so I think we can start with uh, a couple of questions in the chat. We just scroll through and find a few. So one question, um, Evan, for you, which we on cellular. So. How does the cellular data transmission work? Uh, do you need to establish a local cellular account when deploying abroad? Uh, yeah, great question. No, you, you don't need to establish a local cellular account. So our cellular telemetry provider um, does all of the carrier aggregation. Uh, the, there's no configuration that's needed on your end to get the data from your system into your uh, so far API access. Uh, we want to make something that is as simple as possible to configure. We'll be providing more detailed guides on how to make sure that the, the cellular solution 
will work in your intended location and area and our, our uh, sales and engineering support are happy to assist folks with that. Uh, but essentially it's a plug and play solution. You get your system, you turn it on uh, and the data starts flowing to your dashboard and API immediately. Thanks, Evan. Um, and then one question, another question about cellular is if cellular is available in Ecuador. Um, so for any region specific requests, we will be publishing some documentation on the website around where uh, cellular is and is not available. So you can get in touch with us directly uh, and we can send that to you now, um, or uh, we will have it up on the website in the next couple of weeks. Uh, hey, Nevin, I got a couple of questions that came in via email. Um, sure. And you actually answered the, the first one that was a common one. The second one is, um, is there a plan to um, from spotter three, spotter two to spotter three? Is there a program to, tr to transfer up? Um, unfortunately, there's no program to upgrade from a spotter two to a spotter three. Uh, there, there's no way to swap electronics or just do a, a firmware update. Um, if you want a spotter three, you will have to purchase an entirely new GUI. Excellent. And then the, uh, the, the last one I have is, will a spotter be able to send maximum wave height alerts? Yeah, so that, that feature isn't in place today. That is uh, very high on the, the list. So we actually did a, a survey with existing customers um, to request uh, the, the most desired features. Uh, that's where the intent to send the higher time density spectra came from. That capability actually allows us to support a lot of features like uh, tuning spectral analysis to certain conditions low energy, being able to run more sophisticated analyses for um, full directional plots. Um, the, the max wave height, so both HMAX and maximum observed wave are very high on that list. Now that we have the over there update capability, we will be able to develop uh, firmware in a more agile way than traditional. So we don't have to lock it to the hardware. We'll let users opt in to select which updates they want. And uh, I can't give a detailed timeline, but I can say that uh, HMAX and Maximum Observed Wave are very high on the list of upcoming features. So certainly expect to see those later this year. Thanks, Evan. Um, one other question I see that, that comes through that I just want to clarify is uh, someone asking about over-the-air updates working on legacy spotters. All of the features that we just discussed today are only available on the spotter three. So that would require a new spotter in order to take advantage of any of those features we talked about. Um, moving on from there, uh, I think another interesting question with regard to the smart mooring or are there any plans to integrate more sensors like DO, um, pH, turbidity, et cetera, into the smart moorings? Absolutely, we would like to integrate more sensors off the shelf. Uh, that will happen. It's just a matter of, of timing, and I think you'll you'll see some exciting updates in 2023, no doubt. Um, and then another question for you, Evan, is what happens during temporary temporary cell outages? Is data stored and resent later? Yes. So there there is a queue that uh, is persisted on board, and so. The exact behavior of that in terms of how long can it weather the cell outage depends on the configuration, um, but, it, but it will be able to store up data locally for hours and then it'll flush the queue to make sure that all of the data is received in the end. It's actually the same mechanism that's implemented for the satellite telemetry today. Awesome. Um, and then one other question that I think is, is interesting is I was wondering if improvements to spike detection slash loss of GPS have been made to improve data QC. Yes, so that that is a, a, a feature that is enabled by the cellular capability uh, in sending um, the higher density uh, spectra. So, so there is a uh, a track to improving performance there on board, uh, which we're pursuing as well. Uh, but with the higher time density specter, we can actually apply that spike detection and rejection uh, in the back end and essentially remove realizations that are polluted 
from the larger analysis. These can happen um, when there's a, a significant overwash. It can happen as a mooring effect. Um, it can happen if the, the signal environment is heavily obstructed. Uh, it's certainly something that will be greatly improved by the higher data rate feature. Uh, we also have in the roadmap plans to address that with more sophisticated onboard filtering as well for customers that need satellite telemetry. Great, thanks, Evan. Um, Todd, any other questions that have come through via email? No. Okay. Um, yeah, so it looks like we have a couple of others that are popping up still. So what is the depth range of smart mooring? Evan, do you want to take that? Maybe also on top of that, speak to any limitations in terms of the number of sensors that can be integrated on a smart mooring? Yep. So um, uh, today we are specifying a maximum depth of the deepest node of 50 meters. It's relatively conservative. Uh, the design of the connector is intended to scale to full ocean depth where online testing and certifying every connector to 100 meters. Uh, there is you know, a, a, a clear path to extending that deeper and deeper. Um, I, I would say that I would encourage folks to reach out if they have an application that pushes outside of the bounds of what we are uh, specifying as our operational limits for smart mooring system, um, where we're also, uh, Nevin, you mentioned nodes. Uh, any combination of three sensors anywhere in the smart mooring uh, will work. We have excellent test coverage for that. If you have an application that needs more, reach out to us. We can talk about uh, capabilities, risks, timing. Um, we're, we have a, a lot of paths to expanding the, the capabilities. Definitely need to hear from you in terms of which limiting factors are uh, the highest priority ones for, for everyone that's working with the system. Great, thanks Evan. Um, one other question too that, that's just coming through now is will the high density spectra be sent with some kind of QC slash status or, or flag? Um, or is that something that the customer is gonna have to deal with on, on their end? Yeah, so we will have our own internal um, uh, flags describing any metadata for the high density spectra. Uh, it will also be, for, for people that are getting a little more under the hood, it'll also be available for them to ignore those flags and apply their own processing techniques, so. Got it. Um, and Kurt, it looks like Kurt just asked, is the Spotter 3 with cellular available now? It is available now. Uh, we will ship the first batch of them in the first week of September, and then uh, they will be available for standard delivery, just like any other Spotter from, from then on. Um, Evan, one other question that I just thought of that might be useful for the, the audience is, it, it, are there any limitations with the smart mooring in sending data using cellular, or will everything be available on the smart mooring um, to take advantage of, of the cellular capabilities on the spotter? Yeah, so uh, as far as the rest of the system is concerned, uh, there's no difference between cellular or satellite telemetry. Um, so the, uh, it's, it's opaque to something on the smart mooring as to whether or not it's sending over cellular or satellite, it'll be able to send uh, data in either path. Obviously, if we dial up the data rate significantly, you won't want to do that over satellite, uh, but there's no limitations as far as which elements can send data over which channel. Got it. Thanks, Evan. Um, and it looks like Steve asked about the accuracy of the wind imprint um, from the spectral data and the impact that fetch has. You're absolutely right, Steve. Uh, the fetch does have an impact on the, the wave field's ability to fully develop, which does have an effect on the accuracy of the wind proxy. Uh, it is not a direct measurement, but we find that it works really well in areas where that wave field is able to develop completely. Um, 
One other smart mooring question for you, Evan. How much power is available to the client smart mooring sensor? Good question. So um, maximum power of uh, three watts. So if you're going to uh, consume power uh, for a kind of continuous time scale, that would be three watts. Uh, there are very few locations where a three watt power budget is sustainable from an energy budget standpoint. So there are configuration tools in the smart mooring um, to, to enable the smart mooring with the duty cycle. Uh, depending on where you are in the world, uh, the available total energy that's generated sustainable from the solar panels um, will range from hundreds of milliwatts to a couple watts. Uh, but when we're thinking about just, you wanna run a sensor for a certain period of time, there will be three watts available to that sensor to be able to operate continuously. Great. Um, one other question from Kurt too is, will the new smart mooring have SST integrated into the hull? Uh, on, no, it does not have SST, free SST in the hull yet on Spago 3. Um, and then with regard to airdrops, are parachutes used for aerial deployments? Does the impact of the sea affect the calibration of the barometric pressure sensor? Uh, no, parachutes are, are not used. And um, no, the impacts do not affect the calibration of the barometric pressure sensor. It's a solid state MEMS sensor. Thanks, Evan. Um, and then another question from Giles that came in is, could the smart mooring connect to a seabed mounted instrument? Yes, it could. Um, but a question for you, Evan, I think is, is the flexibility slash wear on the mooring at the seabed a solved problem or do we have any recommendations there? Yeah, no, it, it's, it's not a solved problem. Um, this is one where it really needs to be designed for the deployment environment. Um, so removing the ability for the cable to relieve built up torsion can absolutely cause uh, serious mooring problems. And so there are some solutions that we're exploring with uh, partners and customers to that. Um, I, I, I saw that uh, earlier in the question stream, there was an ask around a, a swivel or a kind of rotary contact solution. Uh, that's being explored. There are other ways of getting power and data to a seabed mounted sensor uh, that are being explored. Uh, but that is a application that needs some pretty dedicated and hands on mooring consideration work. Um, and we're happy to engage with customers on on that and dig into the details there. Uh, I'll also say that we are uh, providing solutions, for example, for a, a, a depth sensor. Um, we're able to get our pressure sensor in mooring line mounted very close to the bottom. We're able to uh, significantly limit its possible excursions with our modular flotation. Uh, and so for a lot of applications that think they need a seabed mounted sensor, there might be a solution that works with a mooring mounted sensor that we're happy to discuss as well. Great, thanks Evan. Um, and I see that a few folks are still raising hands. Uh, I just encourage you to put your questions in the chat if you have any remaining. We still have a couple of minutes left, so uh, we're, we're happy to answer more questions if you put them in the chat. Todd, anything else from, uh, from email or on your end? I think you might have answered it, but it, it might be one of those ones where it might not hurt to just reiterate it again. But the question is, is um, in several different forms, is what kind of data can I send over cellular? Yeah, so um, you can send all the data uh, that is available over satellite telemetry today uh, and at, at higher rates. Uh, so we will be rolling out new data products uh, like HMAX and maximum observed wave. Um, there's additional metadata that is is sent about the, the system with regards to cellular. So make sure that uh, we can 
understand signal performance in, in various locations. Um, and then the, the first feature taking advantage of that higher data rate capability on the squatter side is uh, the, the higher time density wave spectra. On the smart mooring side, it's, it's the ability to send, to configure for uh, much higher bandwidth sampling. So you can, you can send readings from smart mooring sensors at much higher sampling rates uh, and dramatically lower costs. And is there an approximate number of cost savings using cellular? I, I can't give a detailed price. Um, it is orders of magnitude. So it, it, it goes from being one of the big cost considerations of deploying and maintaining a spotter system uh, to being in the noise as far as overall costs. And we'll, we'll be uh, releasing detailed pricing information and, and guides on how pricing is affected by usage uh, in the coming weeks. And Evan, on that note too, what, what is the fastest update rate we're going to offer with cellular? So the, the fastest update rate, so this is the reporting interval now, there's the underlying sampling interval, which is how, how often are we capturing data? And then there's how frequently are we reporting that? Um, it, it will be five minutes will be the fastest update rate that uh, can be set for periodic reports or for cellular. Great. Um, one other technical question for you is, have we done anything in the Spotter 3 to improve the accuracy of wave direction data? So there, there aren't any changes to the core wave onboard uh, wave processing algorithm in the Spotter 3 launch. Uh, there is the ability to apply more sophisticated processing to the spectra offline. Um, which can improve uh, directional estimates. Great, thanks, Evan. Um, another question on where data is stored. All of the, the raw data is still stored on the SD card uh, as with previous generations of Spotter. Uh, so you would be able to process that on your own. Um, and then Evan, another question, just to clarify again, can we send raw displacement data over cellular? Um, I know you talked about the high density spectrum, but maybe clarify that. Yeah, that, that's not going to be a capability at launch. Uh, if you're interested in receiving the raw um, wave displacement data in remote reports, uh, I'd, I'd love if you'd reach out to us and uh, explain the use case. It's, it's certainly something that we, we could add to the system as part of our uh, over the air update rollouts. Thanks, Evan. Um, one other question from Patrick from earlier is, is have we ever thought about uh, utilizing the buoy motion for charging on board the, the battery on the spotter in addition to the cellular? Or sorry, in addition the solar. to the solar. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we've done um, assessments of that. Uh, the available technology isn't quite there yet when we think about uh, how much power would actually be generated with our uh, surface signature. Um, a moored system, there are some tricks that can be played to, to get a little more. So we're, uh, we actually have uh, conversations open with folks that are working on energy harvesting for small systems uh, like ours. Uh, those are still in an academic phase. And so there's, there's no off the shelf solutions we're aware of that uh, would be clear winners for adding meaningful power on top of solar by doing motion energy harvesting. Great, thanks, Evan. Um, two more questions I think we probably have time for. So what would be the shallow depth limitation on deployment of the spotter? So I think that this is a question about how shallow can we go with, this, with the smart mooring? Um, is there a limit there, Evan? Um, there, it, there's not a hard limit. We've had people deploy smart moorings in uh, five meters or less of water. Uh, it certainly is something that needs to be carefully considered from a mooring design standpoint. Um, the Any tidal changes, any wave changes, structure that the system could interact with at those shallow depths can be problematic. Uh, so 
that's another one where if, if you have a, a use case that it feels hard, don't hesitate to reach out to our team for uh, advice and, and input on how to configure a system and what the risks might be for that. Great, thanks, Evan. And last question for the day. Um, does the Bristlemouth technology allow for data transfer from a client's payload package? And if so, uh, what are the protocols that we can interface with? I'm not sure if I exactly follow the, the question, but I'll, I'll give a, a general rundown of uh, the Bristlemouth technology. Um, and also to, to clarify, there's the, the Bristlemouth technology covers a full stack for connectivity. So there's the connector standard, there's power distribution, um, there's modulation of data, there's networking layer, there's protocol layer. Uh, except for early partners who are doing integrations with this, we have not um, broadly launched those capabilities. So uh, that will be coming later this year. There'll be dev kits available for uh, working with our systems early next year. Um, the, the general protocol stack is it is a, it's an IP network. Um, so we have addressed messaging. It's a peer to peer formation. So any node can, uh, can freely start a transaction with any other node. And then there's a messaging framework on top of that that supports a request and re response patterns, which would allow clients, typical client interactions. Uh, it also supports pub sub patterns. Um, with either of those mechanisms, you can have uh, clients sending and retrieving data from other nodes in the system. And they're kind of well, well used patterns in uh, modern network applications. Great. Thanks, Evan. Well, I think that brings us to time. Um, some really great questions that came through. Really appreciate, Evan, you taking your time to, to share more about the technical details of the Spotter 3 and to everyone who joined. If you have questions that you still would like to have answered, uh, feel free just to reach out to me. That's actually my cell phone and my email on the, the slide right here. Um, you can contact me anytime and we're, we're happy to chat and encourage you to reach out. So thanks again, everyone. And we hope to talk to you more about the Spotter 3 and the Smart Morning soon.